Okay. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to God, the Lord of the world. Ya Subuhu. Welcome to our uh, session six of our uh, slow read of the Fusus al Hikam. Um, this is quite a wild chapter of the book. Um, and uh, even though it is a short chapter, I thought that we would split it up into two sessions because there's a lot of different ideas at work here. And um, covering it in, in one session only is, I don't think it's going to cut it because there's going to be a lot of different angles of questions to this. Um, so I think we should get cracking in this first half and then leave our discussion for a after I, I finish the chapter. I'll read the first paragraph of the Arabic first, which I have in front of me here in the, um, in the Sayyid Ahmed edition of this. There's one other person trying to get in. Okay. Um, فَصُّ حِكْمَةٍ سُبُوحِيَةٍ فِي كَلَمَةٍ نُوحِيَةٍ عَالَمًا تَنْزِي إِنَّ أَهْلِ الْحَقَائِقِ فِي الْجَانِبَ الْإِلَاهِيَةِ أَيْنَ الْتَحْدِيدِ وَالْتَقِيِّدِ فَالْمُنَزَّهُ إِمَّا جَاهِلٌ وَإِمَّا صَاهِدُ الصُّوَى أَدَبٌ The wisdom of exaltation in the word of Noah. For those who truly know the divine realities, the doctrine of transcendence imposes a restriction and a limitation on the reality. For he who asserts that God is purely transcendent is either a fool or a rogue, even if he be a professed believer. For if he maintains that God is purely transcendent and excludes all other considerations, he acts mischievously and misrepresents the reality and all the apostles, albeit unwittingly. He imagines that he has hit on the truth, while he has completely missed the mark, being like those who believe in part and deny in part. It is known that when the scriptures speak of the reality, they speak in a way that yields to the generality of men the immediately apparent meaning. The elite, on the other hand, understand all the meanings inherent in that utterance, in whatever terms it is expressed. The truth is that the reality is manifest in every created being and in every concept, while it is at the same time hidden from all understanding, except for the one who holds that the cosmos is his form and his identity. This is the name, the manifest, as Zahir, while he is also unmanifested spirit, the unmanifest, al batin in this sense, it is in relation to the manifest form of the cosmos. In this sense, it, the all high, is in relation to the manifested forms of the cosmos, the spirit that determines those forms. In any definition of man, his inner and outer aspect are both to be considered, as is the case with all the objects of definition. As for the reality, it may be defined by every definition, for the forms of the cosmos are limitless, nor can the definition of every form be known, except insofar as the forms are implicit in the definition of the cosmos. Here, Ibn Arabi is completely dismissing the entire Aristotelian organon on real definition, etc., Thus, a true definition of the reality is impossible, for such a definition would depend on the ability to fully define every form in the cosmos, which is impossible. Therefore, a complete definition of the reality, al-haq, is impossible. It is similar in the case of one who professes the comparability of God without taking into consideration its incomparability, so that he restricts and limits it and therefore does not know it. He, however, who unites in his knowledge of God both transcendence and immanence in a comprehensive way, is it not being possible to know such a thing in detail, owing to the infinitude of cosmic forms, knows him in a general way, but not in a detailed way, as he may know himself generally, but not in detail. In this connection, the Prophet said, Man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabu. He who knows himself knows his Lord. Actually, this is not a prophetic hadith, and as uh, Sayyid Nizam al-Din Ahmad 
in its critical edition, it noted in the in the uh, footnotes this. Uh, if you search through all the uh, you know the six books of the Sunni hadith, um, etc., in the Musnad, you will not find this hadith, but it is part of a Shiite canon of hadith, and uh, it, it is actually a saying of Ali alayhi salam. He so in this connection, the Prophet said, "Whosoever knows themselves knows their Lord." Man linking together knowledge of God and knowledge of the self. God says. We shall show them our signs in the horizons, meaning the world outside you, but in your and in yourself, here meaning your inner essence, Ainik, till it becomes clear to them that it is the real. In that you are its form and it is your spirit. You are in relation to it as your physical body is to you. It is in relation to you as, as the spirit governing your physical form. This definition of you takes account of your outer and inner aspects for the form that remains when the governing spirit is no longer present may no longer be called a human, but only a form resembling a human, there being no real difference between it and the shape of wood or stone. The name human in San may be given to such a form only figuratively, not properly. On the other hand, the reality never withdraws from the forms of the cosmos in any fundamental sense, since the cosmos in its reality is necessarily implicit in the definition of the divinity, not merely, merely figuratively as such with a human when living in the body. Just as the outer form of a human gives praise with its tongue to its spirit and the soul that rules it, so also did God cause the cosmic form to give praise to it. Although we cannot understand its praise by reasons of our inability to comprehend all the forms of the cosmos. All things are the tongues, the lisan of the reality, giving expression to the praise of the reality. God says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise belongs to God, the Lord of the worlds. For all praise returns to it, who is both the praiser and the praised. If you insist only on its transcendence, you restrict it. And if you only insist on its imminence, you limit it. If you maintain both aspects, you are right. An imam and a master in the spiritual sciences. Whosoever would say it is two things is a polytheist, while the one who isolates it tries to regulate it. Beware of comparing it if you profess duality, and if you unity, beware of making it transcendent. You are not he, and, and you are it, it or he. And you see him in the essences of things both boundless and limited. God says, there's not like unto it, asserting its transcendence. And it says, and it is the seeing, the hearing, implying comparison. On the other hand, there are implicit in the first quotation, comparison, albeit negative, and duality in the word like, ka. And in the second quotation, transcendence and isolation are implicit it alone being named. Had Noah combined the two aspects in summoning his, his people, they would have responded to his call. He applied to their outer and inner understanders, saying, ask you, Lord, to shield you from your sins, for he is forgiving. Then he said, I summon them by night inwardly and by day outwardly, but my summons only make them more averse in the outer. He states that his people turned a deaf ear to his summons only because they knew innately the proper way for them maintaining of maintaining God's imminence in his many forms to respond to his summons made from the standpoint of unity and transcendence. Those who know God understand the illusion Noah makes in respect of what he knows to be the real yeah. state of his people in that by blaming them, he praises them. Yeah. Since he knows the reasons for their not responding positively to his summons, the reason being that his summons 
was made in the spirit of discrimination, seeking to oppose transcendence to imminence. The whole truth is a conjunction, Al-Qur'an. Ibn Arabi is deriving Qur'an from, from another root, uh, Qarana. The whole truth is a conjunction, Al-Qur'an, as the, as the whole revelation, not a discrimination, Al-Furqan, from Faraga, the to separate, a chapter of the Qur'an, a part. One who is firmly established in his knowledge of the conjunction does not dwell on the discrimination. For the former, Al-Qur'an, includes the discrimination, the chapter, both aspects in their apparent opposition, and not vice versa. It is for this reason that the Qur'an, the union of the two aspects, was vouchsafed to Muhammad and this community, which is the best granted to humankind. The quotation, there's nothing like unto it, combines the two aspects. Had Noah uttered this kind of saying in summoning his people, they would have responded positively to him, for he would have combined in the single verse the transcendental and immanental modes, nay, even in a half a verse. Noah summoned his people by night in that he appealed to their intellects and spirits, which are unseen, and by day in that he appealed to the evidence of their external senses. But he did not unite the two as in the verse there's nothing like unto it. For this reason, their inner selves, given to the immanental aspect, recoiled from his summons because of its discriminatory nature, making them even more averse on the outer level. Then he told them that he summoned them in order that God might shield them from the sin of excessive imminence and not to reveal or uncover for them his transcendence as an absolute. This they understood from him according to their outer senses so that they put their fingers in their ears and tried to cover themselves with their clothes. This is an external form of shielding to which he had summoned them, although they responded literally by their action not in a humble surrender to God's shielding. In the verse, there's nothing like unto it. Similarity. Um, yeah, I'll find something. Hello? Can you shut okay. the microphone, please? In the verse, there's nothing like unto it. Similarly, it is at once implied and denied. Because of this, Muhammad said that he had been granted knowledge of God integrating all its aspects, the Jawami al kalim Muhammad, unlike Noah, did not summon his people by night and by day, but by night, during the day, an inner summons implicit in the outer one, and by day during the night, the outer truth being implicit in the inner. And I'll leave it here um, for this, this as the half of the chapter we're covering for this week, um, because there's this chapter is extremely dense, but it's an extremely important um, uh, part of the Fusus al-Hikam because of the interplay between transcendence and imminence. And the way that Ibn Arabi is reading um, these verses of the Quran is extremely novel uh, and fascinating. Um, for example, the, the verse that we have, and it's from the Surah Al-Fatir, there's nothing like unto him. In the original Arabic, um, there's two things going on uh, with the word mythin, right? So, laisa ka mitlihi sheyu. And the question that both theologians and linguists, and especially the Sufis, have continually asked is that the, the particle ka, like, is appended to the word for like, mythil. And so, one group of theologians have, have constantly said, well, this is zayat, meaning it's a, it's a, it's just a floor, addition, it's an additional floor, it's just merely reinforcing a, a point. Whereas in the commentaries on the Fusus al Hikam, there's a long discussion, and, and Qaisari especially spends probably a good 10 pages just dis discussing this ka metl, you know, uh, like like. Because if we translate laisa ka lihi into English, it would be not nothing like like it. So there's two likes. Mitl means like, and ka as the particle for like. So, um, this has been a uh, in the commentary tradition, in the tafsir tradition, 
Um, so much ink has been spilled in trying to explain what is going on in the Quran that um, because from a grammatical point of view, this is like a redundancy. So this is the argument that the the, the ka, the particle ka, k, that is appended to myth like is a is a redundancy. Whereas no, Ibn Arabi is saying that this is actually explaining a situation between transcendence and imminence, and that the, the following clause and it is the hearing, the, the seeing, is then qualifying what the transcendence and imminence is. And in this commentaries, uh, there's, a, in the way that the, um, they unpack this verse, um, there are several different positions where there's a reversal, where one part of the verse represents the transcendence, the other the imminence, and then there's a role reversal where one is, becomes the imminent and the other one becomes the transcendent. It's absolutely fascinating in the way that, especially the Qaysari, um, and then those who you know basically reiterate his point of view, unpack this particular verse. But this is a, a, a really deep meditation on the meaning of transcendence and imminence. Um, and this particular half of this chapter that we've read so far um, is unpacking all of this. And he begins it, in a very interesting way, by basically dismissing theologians and particularly uh, those mutakallimun, such as the mutazila, uh, the 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 all uber rationalist theologians that take basically all attributes of God as basic metaphors and and um, just figurative, and um, strip God of all attributes and maintain a transcend transcendence that effectively makes God absent from anything you know, related to the world. And even Arabi right off the bat is attacking this position um, because this is not the position of the Quran and it's also not the position of common sense. Um, so this rationalist position um, is itself laden with contradictions that Ibn Arabi is then, you know, basically slowly but surely unpacking um, such that we cannot talk about God in any sense without simultaneously admitting to God's transcendence and imminence. Um, and that the two are complementary rather than in opposition. And this is a very difficult concept to get your head around outside the languaging. Because um, in you know the normal uh, Aristotelian excluded middle kind of logic, you know, something either is this or is that, but cannot be both. You know, whereas this is a different kind of, of um logic it and especially since it it very much incorporates what in in the history of logic we call the tetra lemma where something is is not and is both at the same time the aristotelian view rejects this but even arabi fully subscribes to this kind of uh non-dualist logic and he's saying that this is the way to approach the question of transcendence and imminence um and what it is also implicitly doing is basically um, throwing reason at, with a small r out in any discussion of, of the God-human relationship. We cannot think our way. We cannot reason our way. We cannot, in the, you know, in the philosophical sense, ratiocinate our way into understanding God. And what he does especially is beautiful where he, you know, um, throws the entire Aristotelian organ on. The, the you know how you define things you know species subspecies real definition etc he throws it out you know because there are um an infinite variety of things and creations within creation right um and because all of them point to god therefore a definition of god is impossible because we cannot em enumerate absolutely everything in existence um right there this basically nuances even any understanding that we may have of the concept of imminence, um, because the accusation usually within these debates is that if you imminentize God, then you are trying to restrict God by defining God in a particular thing. And Ibn Arabi is saying, fooey, that's not the case at all. God can be imminent, but then because of the innumerality or the infinity of things cannot be defined, therefore your argument falls. You know, so you cannot, you know, then then accuse anyone of restricting God in any sense because of that very reality. But then that also simultaneously is not the transcendent that cannot be defined because it 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 it, it is above all um, all delimitations as the, as the language of Ibn Arabi would say. 
Um, yet simultaneously, it is that that cannot be defined because it is beyond everything. But simultaneously, it can be known in terms of its presence within everything without being defined. Um, this is pure genius because before Ibn Arabi, Arabi um, even among the Sufis, these sorts of concepts were always very defined in extremely poetic and symbolic forms, never using the language of philosophy itself in the manner that Ibn Arabi has utilized it, you know, to explain the situation. Um, and, you know, obviously a, a, you know, philosopher or rationalist coming from an Aristotelian or Avicennan, um, you know, point of de departure is just going to be bewildered at what Ibn Arabi is doing because it just it doesn't make sense to them because of the uh, of their being restricted to understanding things from the point of view of the Aristotelian organon. Um, I have read this chapter many, many, many times and meditated on it um, because of, of just the profound depth um, that Ibn Arabi reveals about this dialectic between transcendence uh, and imminence. And next week, when we get into his interpretation of several of these Quranic ayat um, about the people of Noah, it just it is both extremely unsettling in the way that he interprets these verses um, and just profound. I mean, he just basically grabs you and takes you into that reality. Um, and there's only one other person in the entire history of Islam I have seen to, you know, take Quranic ayat and interpret them in such a radical way as Ibn Arabi does. And that is the Bob. You know, no one other than these two I have found have that ability to just like, you know, flip all the tables on everybody on the meaning of these verses. Um, like those two have. And that's, you know, that's why I see, I see a mirror of Ibn Arabi within the Bob all the time. Anyway, I'll open the floor. And if you have any questions, um, et cetera, let's get cracking into those now. Hassan, Jeff. <laughs> If nobody else has a question, I could yes. um, ask a question. Go for it. Um, um, I, I, I kind of see, and this is something that was brought up in the last chapter as well, but there's a lot of um, resonances between this doctrine of imminence and transcendence that Ibn Arabi is expounding on here, as well as the, well, essentially, like, the first thing I think of is Christianity, because that's, like, kind of the kind of central motif with the whole, you know, Christology, man-human thing. Mm. So there's, like, I guess that sort of resonance and um, uh, like a mirroring there. And I yes. know he, he does bring, bring up, you know, the son and the father, like the son and the spirit in the last chapter. Uh, so I guess that's something else to think about. But what I'm trying to understand is that, you know, how do you like, what what is the locus between this eminence and transcendence? Like, how are we to understand that? you know, in a phenomenal world, like in our world, how are we supposed to like, like it's like, it seems, this seems like something that's essentially like apart from experience, but like outside of experience, it can't be communicated in words. Like, and if that's the case, then, you know, it's kind of, I guess it's hard to fully understand this. And you, I guess I'd like your input well, on that. Practice is what makes you see it. I mean, if I sit here and describe and give a long, you know, philosophical excursus between imminence and transcendence, um, you're going to basically only capture a ratiocinative aspect of what this means, right? Only experience on this path will show the difference between the two. How something is both, can be both transcendent and imminent at the same time. Now, since, you know, we're throwing all caution to the winds, as Ibn Arabi does in this chapter, uh, especially in the latter part of it that we're going to get to next week. One thing that I I will say, you know, for people who have not had this experience before in their lives, is that if you approach, for example, um, the psychedelic experience or the entheogenic experience as a believer, just purely based on the experiential dimension of it, these um, plants do give you a glimpse and a taste, a dog, of this you know, distinction between the transcendent and the imminent, right? 
I'm not now telling people to go run out and, and get themselves DMT or, or ayahuasca or take you know a bunch of mushrooms. But what um, this particular entheogenic experience will give you is a taste of that very thing. You know, without me sitting here, um, you know, giving a long excursion, if you want it immediately, if you are more patient um, and want to do this and understand this more methodically, then what you do is you put yourself in a chalwa, a, a 40 day retreat, you fast and you recite a name of God for that 40 days. You have no interaction with humanity um, and you are in a place where you are not disturbed by anyone or anything. And by probably about the 30th day, um, you know, the the veils will start to fall very quickly and you will begin to taste that as, as well. Now, most modern people in our time don't have the luxury of being able to lock themselves away for 40 days meditating. Um, so, you know, the other, the only thing available if someone is desirous to have this sort of experience and to understand it um, is to have, in my opinion, a controlled um, experience of, of these entheogenics, you know, to get a glimpse of that. Because what they do is essentially very momentarily, of course, they open the doors of perception. They they lift the veils of from the bio from the biological angle of yourself and allow you to have a glimpse to the other side. The difference is, in my opinion, people who have um, you know entheogenic experiences, psychedelic experiences, are are only from a Sufi point of view are are having an experience of a hall, you know, a state. Whereas someone who goes and sits in a halwa for 40 days and is reciting a name, at the tail end of that experience, they're attaining a maram, a station. And so then they keep what they have experienced within that state. Whereas the hippie um, or the entheogenesis is only just getting a glimpse and they're back to who they were before they went in. So it's not really transformative, other than the fact that if you've never had an experience like that before, um, it kind of rewires your categories. But with the Sufi or with the meditator who is, um, you know, engaging in a form of riyada, a form of, of self-mortification and, keep, you know, taking themselves out of the world of sense experience or the, the world of, of their patterns and their habits and all of that um, and are sitting very methodically, carefully, you know, um, reciting a, a vicar, um, you know, and attain that kind of experience, then that the experience is fully transformative um, and, you know, takes in, you maintain that state and then go on to the next and whatnot. That is what I would recommend. Whereas if I sat here and just basically gave you, a, you know, one hour lecture about the difference between imminence and trend, which is what the commentators of the Fusus are doing, by the way, um, in their commentaries on this particular thing, you may or may not understand it. And if you understand it, maybe only on an on a intellectual level, not on an experiential level. Um, but what I would recommend as an exercise is that if you spend, um, if you are reflective and have a good discipline of self-introspection and you go back into the various events of your lives and try to find in within those events, um, you know, certain patterns of causality that may not be immediately identifiable as being uh, materially located, right? That there's some kind of a guide, that there's something nudging and, and guiding that, that process. More often than not, um, especially if you're utilizing a vicar um, with that kind of introspective exercise, you come to not only the realization of the hand of the spirit being um, present in that particular event, but also you begin to then glean the differences for yourself in your own individuated life the, the difference between transcendence and imminence. Um, and then this in itself becomes a sort of an intellectual journey in the way that Mullah Sadra explains what that means um, in understanding this. And this could take a lifetime. It could be a, um, a major part of your self-discovery. It could also be a part of the you know your journey of self-discovery, but it itself will then begin to unpack its own meaning for you as far as your individual life um, is concerned in the events that have transpired in it. But um, all in all, you know, I would say people who have a solid uh, practice of theurgy and not just 
talk about it or get trapped in um, this fallacy that we're witnessing on a daily basis on our theurgy list where it's all about the jinn and conjuring and fighting them and doing this and doing that, but really understand what even this, you know, this um, occult ecology is really all about in the way that even Arabi puts things in the Fusus al Um, then you can, you know, your eyes begin to open and you begin to see, you know, the transparency of all things, you know. Um, so that is what I would recommend. And this trans understanding and seeing this transparency in all things is the one thing that really gives you a, a taste of, of the difference between imminence and transcendence, where something, um, in a sense, we're talking about the, the, the reality of a silhouette, but a silhouette that has a reality um, and interacts with you both in, in an immediacy, the imminent, while simultaneously being itself that is removed um, from that immediacy at the same time. These are things that you could you that during the course of a path, and especially when you're practicing a lot with the divine names, they begin to unfold for you, you know, very gradually. Um, sometimes they do they, they come out like that, and you almost have a sort of what they call a fana experience in that particular step where you are annihilated in the name. You you recite a name over and over and over and over again and try to lose yourself as much as possible in the recitation of that name. And then it grips you, it grabs you, it possesses you, right? Um, in a very momentary sort of way, as a flash. This is like the what, what the illumination is, the Ishraq, he would call the Ishraq. Um, or the way that even Arabi would call it a fat, you know, an opening. Um, and then in that moment that it grabs you, um, it gives you a sort of a download about itself at that particular moment. Right, because these these things also have an infinite reality. You know, once you are annihilated in the reality of a name, doesn't mean that you have captured the essence of the name. Because you know, in hua fishani, every day it is upon some task. But once you experience that in that moment, and then what unfolds afterwards in your understanding of what that experience is, this difference between imminence and transcendence begins to um, really gloss itself and make you understand what it's really about. Thanks for that answer. And I think it, it it's basically, it's kind of paradoxical because um, discursive yeah. reasons that we use to like communicate these kind of concepts, like uh, imminence, transcendence, at the end of the day, these that is itself a creation. It's not Absolutely. so like you're in the- 100%. Play yes. in the sand pit yes. of something that you're trying yes. to find the creator of the, you know, it's kind of yes. like a paradox. Like in a in a computer program, you're trying to find the programmer, but it's like you can't do that in the computer program. So, yeah. um and this is why what, what, uh, what Ibn Arabi is doing, he is throwing the Aristotelian organ on, out the window. He's saying, you know, fooey, just go away. Because what you know, what the Aristotelian organon seeks to do in, in its various iterations up to today, in the in the systems of logic that we have, um Everything is about discriminating. You know, you're trying to define or and or by isolating something as opposed to something else. Now, when it comes then to the question of near and far or imminence and transcendence, um, if you come from a relic from a position of relativity of, of distance, right? Especially if you know geometry, um, then these definitions are completely arbitrary. So therefore, all, def all definitions of all things whatever system of logic that we're using by definition are arbitrary. Sure, they have a, you know, in the real world, you know, these definitions have real application and you can see the causality and the effect of these definitions. But from the from a higher standpoint, um, they're arbitrary because by the same token, for everything that we define at some point in time, that definition becomes obsolete. So therefore, there can never be an absolute definition of anything. And that's why the Aristotelian organon by by itself is just completely faulty. You know, because if you define something by one set of definitions at one point in time, and then let's say 10 days down the line, that no longer applies, um, then your definition from the past no longer applies in the present. So then you have to come with come up with a whole arsenal of new definitions for this thing in the future. And this in itself, I think, even since we're talking about computer programming and technology, this in itself and looking at this process 
in itself is a way for us to see the reality of the verse, every day it is upon some new task. So, which is something that Ibn Arabi is telling us to do, to look for God in every definition. You know, that the presence of the All High is in absolutely everything, every context, every category, every definition. And once we attain to that, right, that we, we you know, we aspire, we taste the presence of the Almighty in absolutely everything, then the dynamism of all of this stuff begins to show itself to us. And then also the paucity of human attempts to define and confine and, and um, restrict things in order to understand them, it shows itself as well. Yeah, I guess that's that would be that's kind of the um uh the sort of uh, tragedy of religion, I guess, because it's like oh yeah, it's trying to define that, but within a certain a uh, parameter and guideline, but it's essentially like close to impossible to do so. So you know, yeah. or if not outright impossible. So yeah, I guess it's um it's very uh I guess it's self self defeating, but at the same time, it's that uh, tragedy and self defeat is part of like the infinity of creation so yes you know all these different attempts and none of them really succeed fully but some of them get you know uh in certain uh manifestations they get closer and closer and it's like and to bring it back to, i guess to your geometric metaphor it's i mean i guess that's why circles and spheres were always considered to be like the um divine uh shape because they have no beginning and any attempt to like locate like and refer yourself in that sphere is like arbitrary like you can pick any point and it's the same yeah. like it, there's nothing so yeah mm. so it's all coming together it's a it's a very um very interesting it's i mean this is why one of the reasons among others that i picked this text because it is this the Fusul Salikat is a very much a revelatory text you know and it's coming off of i mean taking left fields on so many different issues that people consider to be certain in their aqidah, Muslims, um, that, you know, no wonder that the Orthodox have a problem with Ibn Arabi, you know, because he is basically shattering. He's doing essentially what Muhammad, peace be upon him, did in the Kaaba by destroying all the idols. What Ibn Arabi is doing is with the Fasus and all, basically is all of his books and, and teachings in general is destroying the idols of the uh, the Muslims, you know, that had accumulated up, up up until that point, where he is reminding them that the true Tawheed is far beyond their attempts to confine it to a to a belief system to an aqidah. Yeah, and that also makes you more sympathetic to like all different schools because you see that you know, somebody, if people are more literalist, people are more, you know, metaphorical, just to go back to what you said at the beginning of the chapter, you know, people who insist on eminence, people who insist on transcendence. I think it's something that they both are trying, like, to get to the same truth. And it's, you know, um, I guess you have more sympathy for it that way. Yeah. Yeah, one has sympathy because one sees that these people are limited and they're limited and they've confined themselves to a particular definition of something that, um, that has contrary definitions. They don't see the dialectic. Um, so, but you know, in the real, you know, in the real real world with a small r, um, these, you know, these sorts of confinements and straitjacketings by human beings can lead to very ugly places. You know, where you have, for example, the reality of takfirism, who's going out and calling all Muslims other than themselves covers, and then you know goes on a killing spree. In the middle of the Middle East, until it's completely, you know, until it is, you know, you need an international effort to put these monsters back into their box, um, and similar. Um, but you know, the, my question, like the question we had a couple of weeks ago, I think Jeff asked it, was that you know, can we come to a point where the masses can really understand these ideas, and once they understand these ideas, can they apply it in the real world? Um, I don't see any evidence for that. It takes a certain mentality um, and a certain uh, maturity um, for people to even come to this place. I mean, even someone like myself, after 30 years of spending and reading these books and contemplating and being on a path, you know, even I sometimes, you know, I may have some problems in really grasping some of these things, you know, in, in, in the concrete and how to apply them in the real world with a small R. 
Um, so how can we then bring humanity as a whole, as it were, you know, onto this caravan, you know, to, to understand, to make it the world a better place? Because the vision that Ibn Arabi expounds, not just in the Fusrus al-Hikam, but also in, in his Futuhat al makiyah if this thing was implemented as a social program, you know, in the way that he conceived it, we would have the Garden of Eden tomorrow, you know, literally. But um, how many people, I mean, forget about Muslims, even people other than Muslims, how many of them can really grasp a lot of this stuff? Even some of Ibn Arabi's most seasoned commentators and followers have had a problem understanding some of this stuff, um, let alone everybody else. I guess uh, in terms of it becoming more popular, um, maybe at the end of history, but I don't think that's going to be in any appreciable time span, maybe, you know, tens of thousands of years, I think. But I don't you know, know but brother. I don't know. We have a, you know, this world is headed, is on a gravy train straight to Armageddon, especially with the environmental and ecological crisis that we have in front of us. You know, yeah. ecological scientists are sounding alarm bells, you know, um, you know, the amount of plastic and poisons that are in our oceans right now, if at any time, you know, the pH balance of the water of the oceans changes and kills off all the organic life form in the oceans, um, we're next because that means the water is poisoned. And if the water of our planet is poisoned, we, we die. As simple as that. And that's just, you know, the pollution in the water. We're not talking about all the other things that are going on. So, you know, this is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we are living in the hour. It is now right at this moment. We don't have the luxury of 10,000 years. It's right now. That's my point of view. I mean, others can disagree, but that is my point of view. I don't know if we have 10,000 days. <laughs> God, that's that for a lot. I hope we do. I hope we have much more. And I think, I hope we have a turnaround sometime in our lifetime, you know, but I don't see it. Not right now. Yeah. I think for the most part, people are happier just to be told what to do anyway. They don't seem to want to think for themselves. They don't seem to want to solve anything on their own. They just want the easy road. Just tell me what to do. Tell me what's what. Okay, thank you. I got it. And then go about their own business without, you know. Let alone... Without any I mean, that's 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 on the level, that's just on the level of the very basic thing, let alone on this kind of level, which would require you to put yourself in a very demanding kind of psychological path that spans a lifetime without any guaranteeing of getting any results, which is what, you know, wayfaring to God is really about. Um, yeah. So, you know, yeah. You know, what is it going to take? I mean, that, that I have thought about this for years. And um, I have some answers, but um, by and large, it's, you know, the, the humanity at the, at the present time is very much like the humanity that is described in, at the conclusion of the chapter of Set. You know, um, they are, you know, and if we take the definition of offspring that is offered here in this chapter of Noah, uh, where, you know, the offspring is defined, you know, al-olad, or walad, is defined in this chapter of Noah as being the fruit of rational thought or the root root of, of reason, what is the acme of all fruits of reason in a human being in an in a ideal situation? One would say, from a Sufi point of view, it would be love. Yet we witness a generation in our time that is incapable of producing that. You look and you see that in, in the most basic fundamental thing of human civilization, human coupling, relationship, the man-woman relationship. You can count on one hand, maybe less, the number of people in the world today, for example, who, you know, couple, marry or stay with someone throughout an entire lifetime or who are um, committed to that person for the duration of a, of a lifetime and don't stray outside of the bounds or go, don't go through a serial number of relationships. I mean, even myself, I did that myself. I'm not saying I'm immune to that, but this is the problem that this humanity is having, whereas the humanity of a previous time um possibly because the you know that because of the lack of technology etc um you know they didn't face you know a partner 
two people who were together, usually um, even a few generations before ours were together for their whole lifetime. They they built a life together. Um, they had children together. They raised children together and then um, got old together and died together and loved one another because they had no other choice but to do that very thing. So what I'm saying is that that is the fruit. Um, you know, that is the true offspring of any human being is to be able to produce something like that, just as, um, you know, the, the very first verse of the Surah Al-Nisa, the, the Surah of Women, says, you know, Oh, people, oh, humanity, you know, be reverent, God-conscious of your Lord who created you as a single soul. You know, and then from, from it, it created its mates, male and female, and dispersed them diffuse them throughout the earth um right now what ibn arabi is saying about the reality of Furqan versus that of quran and it's genius how he does this um, because the, the the word quran is usually derived from another root it's derived from the root qara to read or recite but um you know arabic being a triliteral semitic language you can de you know derive the meanings of words also from other roots so he derives it from karana which means to unite or to connect or to conjunct. And there is a surah in the Quran known as Surah Al-Furqan. Um, Furqan can mean many things. It can mean distinction, but it also, in its basic meaning, means separation. So what Ibn Arabi is doing is putting or pitting Quran, conjunction, union, against Furqan, distinction, separation. Incidentally, the Bab does exactly the same thing, but in a very different way in, throughout the Bayan. Um, so this is absolutely genius because we see this even in the reality of today that the majority of the Muslims in the world are living from the reality of Furqan, of separation, whether it be in the form of their takfirism or whether it be in their forms of where, you know, um, they go from their, they they take their anti-imperialism and, and um, the oppression that is occurring to them, and then ally with another set of tyrants who are just as bad as the one that they escaped from. That is the reality of of, of Furqan, as well, the separation. They're separate. There's no conjunction. There's no union here that, that, that resolves this contradiction and brings to, you know, to a holistic uh, perspective of the kind that Ibn Arabi is, is showing us uh, it, it, from a metaphysical point of view. Um, so that that's that's the situation. Uh, Sidi, I checked uh, even if we take uh, uh, Quran from the mm. literal root Qara, eh, that mm. uh, the root of its meaning it is to put together. We yeah. even don't need to go to Qara. The, yeah. the original meaning of Qara to put together, and then uh, the meaning of reading it is secondary meaning when you are put the separate uh, letters or words together and then you got uh, the meaning there's another interesting um interesting meaning to qara a where um one of the ismaili commentators i can't remember who it was it could be um uh kirmani i'm not i don't remember but he derives the meaning, the master of Qara'a makes it synonymous with Zakara. So that so that it went at the Surah Al-Alaq, Iqra bi ismi rabbika ladi khalaq. You know, recite in the name of your God who, who created you. Um, this particular Ismaili um, reads it as Iqra bi ismi rabbika ladi khalaq. Recite in, in terms of invoke. So say the zikr, you know, repeat the zikr in the name of your Lord who created you, which is genius. But but the, the explanation about why Qara is 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 synonymous with the root Dhaka um is is profound. You know, and I've thought about this for many, many years, which essentially means that the Prophet was sitting in the cave and reciting the names of God. And so that the experience that he got in the cave would have been experienced very similar to what the Sufis have. When they get very deep into the continual recitation of the name and the, and the liquor. Uh, the other thing, uh, 
here when the uh, word Quran is used, what exactly it refers to? Does it refer to the full Quran or chapter of it, or it is some metaphysical meaning beyond that? Both. So remember, he, he remember what Ibn Arabi says right in this part that we just read. Um, all definite there are not just one definition to each thing that he's saying. So um he is meaning both the physical Quran, but also the entire universe at the same time. That okay, so it is the, that Quran is both the book and also al code at the same time. It's not one There's or the your... other, all of them. Yeah. Well, there's your imminence so, and transcendence. There's your imminence and transcendence right there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next thing. Uh, uh, so here, when we put them together, Quran uh, and Prokhon, so. Uh, Yes, uh, as you were saying, transcendence and immanence in the same time. Uh, so uh, uh, the discriminating factor for con, we, if we take it in uh, positive light, uh, let's say it would be uh, the capability to uh, discern uh, the truth from falsehood in uh, uh, one way but the quran uh, in uh, the the opposite meaning that you will be able to put uh, all of that uh, together this is a, such an important point because what ibn and next week when we get to the next half of this chapter of noah ibn arabi really wants to push this specific point from the position of quran versus for Khan, what Ibn Arabi is see, is suggesting that even in the wrong, there is the right, okay? And the example is obviously the people of Noah, right? So the people of Noah reject his call, right? Because um, they cannot accept Noah's approach to the question of divinity from the point of view of transcendence, even though Ibn Arabi is saying that Noah knows that they're right, that the presence of, of, of the real, the presence of Al-Haqq is present within their idols. He knows that. And they know that. And they know that he knows that. Even though they shoot there, that there's a ruse in between Noah and his people. I, the first time I read this, I fell off my chair laughing my head off. But um, it's it's it, it's true. So what Ibn Arabi is saying is that, that even in the position that these people get wrong, they are right. But they're wrong insofar that they're not responding to the summons of God through through the mouth of a perfect human in Noah to come to the transcendence because they've saturated themselves so much with imminence and you know worshiping woods and stuff, etc., um, that they've missed the forest for, for the trees. <laughs> so, but they're also right, even though they're right in a partial way. <laughs> Uh, but uh, 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 continuing from this <laughs> point, at least I feel the way uh, Sheikh Muhyiddin puts the this chapter that it contains some kind, at least uh, I feel that way, some implicit critic also of the Nuh alayhi salam that yeah. he was too stubborn to put the stress only on the transcendence. Yeah. And that in some way caused the reaction of uh, his people. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. This is what I'm saying. I find this chapter. I mean, for for an Orthodox person reading this chapter, they're like, "I stuck for Allah, You know, this is pure heresy. What he's saying, and from their point of view, it is. But the logic is beautiful and true. You know, because. Um, you know, if you are calling merely to transcendence, if you do, for example, let's say um, what some of the classical Ismaili theosophers have done that have made God so transcendent that it has absolutely no relation whatsoever to anything. So then they have to posit all these various chains of intermediaries who are, you know, who are God and not God. Um, Ibn Arabi is also implicitly criticizing them. It's like, what the hell are you doing? It's more simple like that. We can have this dialectic of, of imminence and transcendence occurring 
simultaneously. The presence can, can exist and does exist in all things while being transcendent at the same time. But that transcendence does not mean it is divorced from, from, from its presence in things, you know, which is what, at least if you take the really radical apophatic approach um, that some of these early Hispanic theosophers took, that's where you end up, you know, where, you, you know, we can't even, we can't talk about divinity at all. And so everything just ends up being talking about the hierarchy uh, of the humans, you know, the Dais and the Bobs and the Hujats and the Imam, et cetera. We can't talk about, you know, the the, the metaphysics, the metaphysical pr first principles at all anymore. I mean, if, over time, between, from one Ismaili theosopher to the next, things begin to change. Um, but um, the earlier ones, I mean, especially like someone like Abu Yaqub Sajistani uh, or even Kirmani, I mean, they're, they're, their God is just, we may as not even you know, discourse about God anymore. So if I get the test of it correctly uh, with the Ismailis, uh, they put the transcendence on God, and let's say the immanent aspects, for example, I, uh, the, on the Imam. So yes. you want to see the positive, it, uh, but you will not uh, search for it in, in God, uh, in the Wujud exactly. Mutlak, like, let's say, but yeah. uh, into Imam or the perfect human being, yeah. who is the manifestation. But yeah. the difference, Sheikh Muhyiddin is putting the two uh, opposite aspects directly to, to God. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what's going on. Yeah. Without necessarily then obviating um, the particular perspective that, say, the Ismailis came up with. See, the criticism on one level is this. When you push God into such a transcendental level, and then imbue the imminence only in a hierarchy of humans, right? What is then the macrocosm and what is the microcosm? First, um, and then if you say that, you know, both are then basically an istiara or a metaphor, right? What does that say about the world out there beyond humans? What is the, and then where is God in that, in that terrain? Um, because what ends up happening in that sort of radical transcendental landscape of early Ismailism is that because, you know, the Godhead is completely absent, um, everything that we can know about divinity and spirit can only be known through the imam and his hierarchy, right? So we cannot know anything beyond that. We cannot know the cosmos, and its nature, you know, we can't even talk about the presence of God in that. That principle is just beyond what a, what a, which is what they use beyond the beyond. Um, Ibn Arabi is saying fine, but then what happens in between? What is the nexus? What is the glue in between all of this stuff? He's not denying that the presence of God is 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 not with with this hierarchy of humans, because he's talking about the same sort of things when he talks about the hierarchy of the of the Qutub, the pole, and the Imam of the right and Imam of the left, and the Abdal. Uh, their supports, and then the solitary ones, the Afrad, etc. All of that is present in its own form within Ibn Arabi's um, own system. But um, within all of this, ultimately, is the is the Udur Allah, the presence of God, the absolute itself. And then the dialectic of imminence and transcendence that occurs within that. So it's all-encompassing. Because that particular position is, in fact, he is correct about this. When you think about it, that kind of position where you have this infinity of, of intermediations between you know, creation and the Godhead does, in fact, end up in the form of dualist ontology, which is very problematic. And not just from a, from a point of view of faith, but from a logical standpoint, it becomes extremely problematic. You, know, you end up in, in infinite regress. This this whole tasalsum logic. I have a question. Go for it. Um, are you familiar with the Hesychasts, the Christian Hes Hesychasts? Yeah, Orthodox Christians. Yep. Yeah. So they uh, they talk about the energies versus the essence of God. Yeah. And I'm just trying to find out if this is 
if you can draw the parallel there between sure. uh, imminence and transcendence, that the essence is, and just before you address that, I just add another point. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the energies are what can be experienced mm -hmm. and the essence is the unknowable. So the further uh, my understanding is from my more recent experiences that as one, uh, as one's consciousness is able to access um, to get further, the further you get towards the, <laughs> the further, <laughs> if this makes sense, uh, when you can sort of progress dimensionally in a way, I'm sort of thinking of the way, um, I think it's Dolores Cannon says that you can see a fan mm -hmm. and you can see the, see the blades, but when it's spinning really fast, you can't see it. So she's describing how things that are a bit more outward in the realities or in the dimensions aren't necessarily visible mm. um so if one but but one can see them if one is able to move at that speed as such so the distinction between the energies and the essence is relative to where you are basically sure. that the the something is unknowable only when you haven't been able to perceive it and uh you know glimpse that next level of the reality um I wonder if you could speak uh, to that. Sure. Even <laughs> Arabi would, would put it this way. First, we have the unknowable essence, which he calls the ahadiyatul jam, the, um, the comprehensive exclusive oneness. This would be the essence. From this mm -hmm. essence emerges two kinds of theophanies or self -less. First, there's the, there's the tajalli, the universal tajalli, theophany, self-disclosure of that essence itself. Um, then from this emerges two forms of emanations, which he calls the first one he calls al fayz al aqdas, the the most holy effusion or emanation, and then from that derives al fayz al mughatdas, the holy effusion. The the fayz al aqdas, the most holy effusion, is a universal emanation, right? That then, with the fayz al mughatdas, the 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 uh, holy effusion is responsible for the instantiation and exist existentiation of all things, whether latent or actual. Um, so in the difference between the essence and energies with, with the Hesychas Orthodox metaphysics, and they're also like Ibn Arabi, they're Neoplatonists. So for them, the essence uh, would be what, what I just said, the Hadiyat al-Jam, the, 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 comprehensive exclusive oneness and then the energies would be um this phase al aqdas and phase al muqaddas the the most holy effusion or emanation and the holy effusion or, or emanation um and in the chapter on adam that you missed he glosses this and then his commentators explain this um about the difference between these two modalities of of emanation which are responsible for creation one being universal the other one being particular, but within the, the transcendence imminence question, um, the phase al aqdas, the, the most holy effusion, would be the transcendent aspect because it is the universal aspect of the overflowing and the creative uh, function of the Godhead. Whereas the phase al muqaddas is the more imminent one, and it also then pertains to uh, the immutable archetypal essences, the ayana thabita. Well, which each individual is an instantiation of. So that would be then the imminent element. So when a given wayfarer is traveling their path and they gain more and more knowledge of their immutable archetypal essence, which is the idea that God has of them, um, they begin to experience um, that transcendental God in their own imminent form, which is in the mind of God. Does that make any sense? Yes, yes, the mind of God. So is it is it a bit like creator and creation or matter and yes, spirit? Yes, but at, at that level, at that level, these these categories begin to kind of um, get mm. kind of thin and transparent. Um, so that's oh, sorry. Yes, go on, please. Because according to Ibn Arabi, the Godhead, you know, as it produces creation. Um, it produces creation not just in a universal sense, but all also in its infinite particularities. And every particularity 
has maintains an immutable archetypal essence, <laughs> which is it's for lack of a better way, in the Quranic way that it's put it, el fitra, the the um the primordial essence of each thing. Even Arabic terms it as the ayan thabita or the immutable art, archetypal essences. And each of them is the unique and unique instantiation of existence, of a of a being. Is it like this the spirit? Yeah. The thing, like the signature? Yeah, the signature, but both in a universal and in a particular sense. So and uh -huh. both of these occur simultaneously. So um these essences are both have a universal dimension and simultaneously a particular dimension as well. Um, and that particular dimension for each thing in creation is its connection to God. It sounds a little bit like the Hindu sort of unknowable uh, Brahman, I think, even though it, it's still fairly anthropomorphized yep. yep. uh, versus all the, all the gods and expressions. Yes. Uh, also, is this similar to, you know, how the Catholic Church sees Gnosticism as sort of evil because the, the Catholics see us as spirit become matter? Yeah. Whereas the, the Gnostics say, you know, matter is not spirit. Um, or I don't know if I'm getting that correct. but um, Gnostics, the Gnostics with the capital G, exoriate and demonize matter. Ibn Arabi is saying um, there's no distinction that spirit and matter are actually two sides of the same coin. He's not exoriating matter yes. at all. And he's also not falling into the dualism of the Catholics by saying that spirit becomes matter, and then they put a complete distinction between spirit and matter. Ibn Arabi is saying that 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 this dichotomy is just a are different stages of the same process, and which incidentally, quantum mechanics is beginning to prove as well, because you know we don't know whether uh, matter is a particle. Uh, a form or a wave anymore. Um, it's more and, like a, con a spectrum, a continuity. Yeah, it's a, it, exactly. Rather than a dual. Yeah. yeah. So this is what Ibn Arabi himself is saying, is that there's no there's no opposition between these two things, really. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of perspective. Whereas the Catholics are basically doing a reverse argument to what the ancient Gnostics are saying. The Gnostics are saying that the, that the spirit falls into matter and gets trapped in the world of matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Catholics are saying, well, this is heresy. Matter comes into, <laughs> spirit comes into matter, but matter is not spirit. Mm. Whereas Ibn Arabi is saying, no, <laughs> it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, you, can you shed some light for me on how to try and improve my understanding of the concept of the dunya? Because... Yeah in Islam, that this, the disgust with creation is missing, you know, yeah. yet uh, some of the more orthodox thinking, I feel, and I'm not sure if I'm correct, sometimes veers towards that um, yeah. disgust with creation. Yeah, and this is... Do the, you think so? Or? Yeah, oh, they, they do. The, the, and this is the sort of perspective that Ibn Arabi is criticizing, you know, hmm. because it's seeing a separation between dunya and akhara. What Ibn Arabi mm -hmm. would say is that dunya is merely a locus of perception of the akhara. But only the Sufis are those who are traveling on the way, who have eyes and, and who have um, attained a certain level of realization or capable of seeing this. Such that akhara, the hereafter, is in the dunya right now. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't perceive it or experience it. They're just based, he says this in relation to the discussion in the chapter of Adam about the first and the last, the God is, although we qualify God by these epithets of the first and the last, all, but God cannot be the first of a series or the last of a series. God is beyond the firstness and lastness. Like an infinite loop. Yeah. Sort of, rather than a, yeah. Yeah. Because when we, uh, I watch a lot of like interviews with near death experienced people and, you know, some of them were like raging atheists before they, had them um so that's quite, quite interesting and there is there is a general theme of like the akhira, you know that there's a that there's a a place of love and you know uh, knowledge like all knowledge and then there's a sense that the world is you know like a rough place <laughs> yeah to be in and and and, and for some people it feels can feel like a, a kind of hell you know but then 
that but but then there's also the uh the extreme of that is people feeling like it's you know the world is like a they just hate the experience the whole time they're here and it's all about trying to get out of it and you know sort of graduate from it um yeah. and there's a, almost a contempt you know it's like a like, like a prison um, well i mean what even the way that even Arabi would respond, I would also respond to that. Yes. I mean, this is part of the natural human experience to be frustrated and all of that sort of thing. And especially given the times right now that we're living in, it's very easy to fall into that mental trap. But what Ibn Arabi says elsewhere, not here in the Fusus, he implies it here, but in his Futuhat al Makiya, the Meccan openings, he, he says this outright that um, one of the signs of being veiled from the reality of God is boredom. Um, that and that boredom is responsible for um, this disenchantment and alienation that human beings may feel. Whereas the Gnostic, uh, you know, the Arif Billah or the verifier, Muhakkak, as he defines it, can't doesn't get bored because the the and so therefore cannot become depressed because they see they're seeing that at every moment creation is in flux. And that mm -hmm. and they're they're perceiving, they're seeing and realizing in real time uh, the the verse. You know, every day it is about some new task. They see it, they aspire not just as an abstract intellectual con, but they're actually seeing it, tasting it in their own lives. So mm -hmm. then, his recommendation is that um, if you travel this path, and if you implement this path in your own life and internalize these sorts of truths. Um, then you begin to become on board and you begin to see um, reality as it is and to 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 realize the prayer of the prophet when he says, Allahumma arina haqaib al kama here, oh God, show us the realities of things as they are. Because once you see the realities of things as they are, then you cannot but be in awe. You get into that position that he talks about later in this chapter we'll get to next week. You're in that position of constant hayra. And so you also then realize the prayer of the prophet when he says, oh Lord, increase me in bewilderment of you. Hmm. Because that bewilderment, um, and especially since you then are not then able to define something as good or bad, but it, hmm. it, it surprises you. Every moment is surprising you. Um, then you cannot become pessimistic about the nature of existence you may become you, you can still remain pessimistic about the nature of society and human beings that's that's fine um as long as you don't then you understand that these are impermanent states that even your dissatisfaction with the nature of human society at some point will change because that is an, every stage of humanity is a is a transitory stage mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's an evolution constantly happening. Everything is in flux. It's changing. Yeah. They it's never never step created. in the same river twice. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Right. And Ibn Arabi is a huge advocate for this, not being not uh, setting in the same river twice. So he would even mm -hmm. go so far as saying that you are not the same person from moment to moment. Mm -hmm. You know, which incidentally, again, quantum mechanics mm -hmm. and quantum physics is beginning to prove um, to be the case. Mm -hmm. so it seems like the remedy for that discussed with creation is to see the the continuum yes yeah mm. and the, the the other thing he would say is that on a very basic psychological level although it is a very natural inclination of most humans to always fall into this trap um is that your disgust um or your um, disconcertment with, with the state of the world, in a sense, is your own nafs. It's your anania. It's your um, individuality trying to assert itself against the model that doesn't conform with its ideal, right? He's not saying to then accept things with the world out there, with the human society as they are, right? But he's saying that to shift your focus rather than to the world shift your focus to the master of the world, who's both the master of the world and the, and the year after simultaneously. And that that very famous hadith um, comes into play, you know, create yourself by the attributes or the ethics of God. 
right? So mm -hmm. that then God becomes your mirror. And if God is your mirror and not the world, then you can be in the world and even criticize the way that human beings are behaving and, and doing things, etc. But without that affecting you and your inner life, your inner Lord, um, in any sense of, of, of at all. And that mm -hmm. Um, station is obviously only perfected by prophets and saints fully, you know, who can, you know, walk with their God, mirror their God, continue at every single moment, while at the same time, like Muhammad, you know, get on the, you know, condemn the idols of the Quraysh and their corruption, and, and same with Noah, etc. Thank you. Sure thing. Anybody else? Okie dokie. Uh, uh, oh, Hassan? If, yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, continuing this discussion, that the trap of the Gnostics, the, the trap of dualism, that uh, matter is deprived of uh, spirit. Yeah. That uh, uh, we can say that uh, exoteric Islam is uh, in a quite big degree fault uh, in the same trap of dualism. 100%. And this is very important to 1, the understanding the phenomenon of uh, idol worshipping because <clears throat> this was always a problem for me that this idol worshipping which is highly criticized almost in the whole Quran seems mm. to me uh, something very absurd. Yes. So what is, uh, 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 what is the idol worshiper? It is some uh, stupid uh, man. If you take him literally, he take a piece of wood and then started to worship him. So if you understand the idol worshiper in this stupid way, but this is some kind of uh, mentally uh, ill person, sure, if yeah. you uh, understand. And it uh, does he, not make he, sense what, at what all. Does he say? What, it, what does he say? What he says, he says, look, um, we know that the presence of that real inhabits that piece of wooden stone. But, you know, that person who is worshipping the wooden stone is, is stupid because... Um, he's not realizing that even though that the presence inhabits that wooden stone, the presence is beyond that wooden stone simultaneously. So why worship the wooden stone? But what you put your finger on is very important. Ali Shari, uh, Shari, just uh, I want to add go, just, go just, uh, to the whole question. Go so go uh, that uh, the what I get here that uh, the perspective of the idol worshiper is another perspective. He yeah. sees, uh, for him, it is not just the, the matter, the, the piece of wood, but uh, he sees the, the, the spirit in him. Yes. But the, his error is the, the, the other part, that he doesn't see the transcendence. Yes. Yeah, that, that, and that's, that's Ibn Arabi would, would, would enhance, actually, in his Futwa al makia criticize this other side for that very thing. And he also suggests something in the Futuat al makiyah that then Ali Shariati, of all people, says in one of his lectures that I have, that has stayed with me for a long time. And that is that in the Quran and in the life of the Prophet, the issue between the Quraysh and the early Muslims wasn't even necessarily about worship, as in believing that these deities are real, at least on the part of the ruling classes of 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 Mecca who were opposing Muhammad and the early Muslims. The issue was that these elites, these Qurayshis, you know, the Abu Sufyans and Abu Lahabs, etc., cetera, uh, Lanatullah alayhim, weren't believers at all in any of this stuff. They were profiting <laughs> very substantially from the fact that Mecca was occurring as a central caravan route, right? And what Muhammad peace be upon him, was doing was upsetting their commercial interests by saying, la ilaha illallah. And so they opposed Muhammad not so much from the position of ideology of between, you know, believing that these gods, these, you know, these stones and what they had surrounding and inside the Kaaba were real, but because by saying la ilaha illallah, um, you know, Muhammad was upsetting 
the status quo and the financial one that was enriching the Quraysh. And evidence of this, and this is contrary to, um, you know, contrary to, to what some people think, the issue of the so-called satanic verses that has become such a controversial issue amongst Muslims here alive is as follows. That, and this is also in the Quran itself, that these people had come to Muhammad and they said, okay, why don't you just step back a little from your, you know, from your uh, one dimensional mindset and just, just accept our gods, you know, as they are, and we will accept your Allah and let's all just live happily together. So they were trying to, you know, pull Muhammad in, you know, to kind of absorb him into their little clique and let him have his little gig on the side, right? And we'll make you, and they said, we'll make you the king of this city. You will, you will be the first amongst them. We trust you. We know you're an honest man. You know, before you're, you're, you know, before you declared your prophethood, you know, we all, you know, implicitly, you know, whoever wanted to trust anybody in the city was you. So let's just call it, let's call it truce. You know, let's become friends again. And we'll make you our chief and our, our king in the city. Muhammad said, no. La ilaha illallah. Get rid of all of these things. You know, um, because by saying la ilaha illallah, it threatens that status quo. It threatens their class interest. It threatens their wealth, their position, their everything. <clears throat> and at the end, obviously, the Muslims won <clears throat> because the, the Quraysh made blunder after blunder after blunder. But... Um, this is the reading that Ali Shariati offers about you know the emergence of Islam in, in, in Arabia. But funnily enough, you find this sort of perspective, but phrased and worded in a completely different way by even Arabi in his Fudwat al makiya you know, where he actually says that these people were cynical. You know, they don't they didn't really believe the Christ didn't really believe that these idols they had in the Kaaba and or surrounding the Kaaba were real. You know, they weren't believers in the idols. This was not a war of ideologies. It was the war of cynicism versus truth. As simple as that. Um, so this perspective kind of tweaks issues a little more. And so then when we return to the Quran, um, the tone of these condemnatory verses against the idols begins to change. And then we can start to interpret these verses in the same way that Ibn Arabi interprets the, uh, these verses, such that so it isn't so much the case that if we say Lat Uza al Manat, the three, you know, the, the three goddesses of the of the of the Southern Arabians, the Hijazis, it's not the case that we're just saying that you know, um, these are completely, you know, this is an ideological war, war, and these Horatiites are clinging to these three goddesses, these three triple goddesses for life. No, it's because, you know, the ruling classes are fooling these lower classes and their slaves into subservience, into the idolatry, which they themselves don't believe. And that is nifaq, in essence. And if you go to the dictionary definitions of nifaq in all of the classical Arabic dictionaries, they have these long intricacies that are describing this, where you impose, for example, once something on one group of people and you don't that you don't really necessarily believe yourself. And that is what a monafiq is. And that is what the Quran means by monafiq. <laughs> but uh, do uh, they the, the, the lower class, which were manipulated, believe uh, in their idols? Yes. Then uh, it, it is, let's say, uh, exactly our current situation when the high Ooh. class manipulate with uh, every kind Ooh. of ideas, the yes. freedom, democracy, and so on, the, the yes. common people, and yes. we believe in this created. Uh, yes. Yes, so even Islam, and I've been saying this for years, Islam in the various forms that we have today is our idolatrous. They have turned the Tawheed into shirk. Whether you're talking about the Shias of the Hosa, you know, with their this labyrinthine system of, of, of knowledge, some of, much of which is frivolous, or whether you're talking about the Sunnis who've done the same with theirs, or whether the, all of these other sects, they've done exactly the same thing. I mean, an, an idol doesn't necessarily have to be a, an effigy of something that people bound down to. It could be an idea. <clears throat> and then restricts them, and by doing restricts God, but in their definitions of God. Although God, obviously, subhanahu wa ta'ala, transcends all of this, beyond all of this, yeah. But uh, can I ask a question about that? Sure. 
<laughs> what if the mercy is, uh, what if it's uh, like, if you never step in the same river twice, so you can't always apply a static moral, right? Yes. Like there could be very different variables. So what if the mercy, you know, in a situation socially is the less evolved thinking? Like what well, that, if the, the is... sort of the, le the less conscious people can't necessarily access, you know, Tawhid, so they're, they're you know, at, at that level. So what if the mercy to protect ah, the inno innocent, great, it, this is how I think of the... Great so, yeah. point, great point. Rumi has an entire story in the Masnavi about this, about, Mo about Moses and this shepherd. There's a shepherd who um, talks to God and talks to God as if it's like a like a physical person and, and like you know speaks words of intimate love to the to, to God like like a man speaks to a woman and Moses comes along and, and criticizes this guy how dare you speak to the Almighty in this way and and God then answers Moses we have sent you to unite not to disperse you know why do you tell my mm. servant not to talk to me in this way. <laughs> I didn't mm -hmm. tell yeah, you I know, to tell it yeah. this, you know, let him talk to me however he wants to talk to me. <laughs> mm, mm. And having seen, uh, you know, life in the village in Lebanon. Yeah. I think there's, there can be a very um, erudite judgment yeah. of, you know, these situations that it might be working really well <laughs> to keep people who are not internally, they're not intrinsically motivated. Yeah. you know, because they're at that lower level of understanding. So we have to have a way to keep those people. It's kind Happy. of like the the countries with the concept of hell have the lower crime rates, right? Yeah. Sure. sure. So maybe, yeah, it's um, there may be some at the at the at the higher end that can go into these more, you know, trans uh, transcendent. Uh, I'm not using it well in in this context, but you know, access those, that reality, but maybe those other souls or minds aren't at that point. And so there is, there is an argument, yeah, for to protect the innocent by, uh, through something that is more dualistic. This is the, this is an important point because nowhere, if you look at Quran and Hadith, um, the, the, the attacks by the prophet, um, peace be upon him, is never against the common masses who are actually engaging in the idolatry. I found this very interesting. Ali Shariati first pointed it out, and then I went back to the source and found that, yeah, he's right. It is always at the elites that he's pointing his fingers. They're leaders, not at the masses. Mm -hmm. So the masses, in a sense, you know, if especially they are being imprisoned, even without their own knowledge or, with, you know, about something they're doing, are, are in a sense in a sense, they're innocent of the proverbial crime. Um, but the the leaders and these elites who are profiting with themselves may be extremely cynical about what they're doing. You know, um, those are the people that you go after and you put your figures out. You know, um, and I've, I've, I've been fascinated by this since the first time I, I it was pointed out to me by Ali Shariati in one of his lectures. Um, and in even Arabi, although he doesn't phrase it explicitly in these terms, these arguments are very implied, especially where, especially where he says that we're from the position of God, you know, all are equal. And what, but he means by all, he means all, not some are more equal than others. All are equal. Um, so yeah. But if all are equal, how could the expectation not be put upon the masses? Because like it's, it's almost like you're sort of acknowledging the, that they can't necessarily. Well, the difference between a from okay from the from the larger perspective of being itself, wujud, all are equal, right? But when mm -hmm. we come down to the instantiations of being, especially when we're talking about the dynamics of the society, um, the the issue is to maintain it to in order to maintain that unsullied purity of being. Um, on a social level, when you have people who understand or who are unbelievers, um, but then are casting themselves as, as believers in order to you know, profit from the simplicity or the purity of the believers, 
is something that you can in fact call sin. You know, you can call it a ma'asiyah. And there is a difference in Arabic between the words, there are two primary different words we have in the Quran of, of, of sin. One is khata, right? And the other one is ma'asiyah. Masya is different than Khata. In, in the second half of this chapter in Noah, what Ibn Arabi does with the word Khata is absolute genius, but he doesn't make Khata synonymous with Masya. A Masya is an infraction. It is in, um, when you go to the old lexicographical dictionaries, um, the way that they explain what this means and the, you know, the semantics of Masya it is um, the, the the element of intentionally wanting to do something wrong to somebody else is, is present in that definition of that word. And so what these people, these elites are doing to the people under their care, they're exploiting them, you know. Um, and so that is blameworthy from the position, from the, from the point of view of God. Yeah, that makes sense. Do that. Don't exploit anybody. Um, yeah, so, sorry. Uh, one thing I was thinking of was, um, so sometimes you have these people who take on this position of authority and sometimes they are self-interested. Yeah. But I'm thinking of the story of the Grand Inquisitor from uh, the Brothers Karamazov. I love, love that story. Yeah, go right. ahead. But the yeah. person who takes that responsibility, they believe in God, but they have anger towards God for yes. not for not relieving the existential weight that humanity has. So the responsibility is sort of taken from people onto this grand and onto this cardinal who sincerely believes that he's doing the right thing and that he'll be punished for it but his punishment comes from this sort of um i don't know i suppose this desire to um just relieve people from the burden of choice and i was, I was wondering how this fits yeah. in within this yeah. metaphysics but this is this this is this is a wonderful example it, it, it... That that uh, whole book, The Brothers Karamazov, um, was one of the books that really transformed my thinking as a young teenager. So it's interesting that you brought bring it up. Yes, it, me too. That book changed my yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did me. I was what about 14, 15 years old when I first read that book. Anyway, um, what it does. See, the thing is, what Dostoevsky, at least in that story, is trying to convey is the hypocrisy of of church authority or religious authority in general. And then by the grand in inquisitor dialoguing to Jesus, why did you come back? We had the situation under control. Now you're going to overturn our privileges and, and that, you know, the order of the world that we've created by your presence. Um, this is the nafs al-amara. This is the, the, the concupiscent soul, the, the soul inclining to evil that does not want to relinquish its own pharaonic, um, you know, wanting to be the Lord, being the number one, right? Who does not even want to acknowledge it's God, right? It wants to be, it wants to always say, Ana Rabbikum ala, rather than Subhanallah. It wants to say, Subhani, Ma'azamashani, like Abu Yazid, Bistami, right? And uh, uh, wait, 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 wait. Can you explain that? Okay. Abu Yazid Bastami, one of the great Sufis um, about 300 years before even Arabi, is noted like Halaj to have said, Subhani ma azam ashani. You know, glory be to me, how great is my, my mighty goodness. <laughs> this is an Iranian Sufi about like the 10th century. Very influential Sufi, many lineages traced back, and he's got all these extremely paradoxical sayings uh, and whatnot that scandalize the Orthodox. Um, in the Quran, the story of Pharaoh and Moses, there's a passage in where Pharaoh says, uh, when Moses is talking about God, the reality of Allah, Moses says, I am your Lord, the Most High. You know, what, are you, what God are you talking about? I am. right. And this is then taken as a typology of the nafs, of, of the, you know, the, the soul inclining to evil, the nafs al-amara bil su that wants to only be its own God, right? Which in a sense, as we will read next week in the, in the second part of this chapter of Noah, in a sense, it is right, but it is occurring from the position of unawakenedness. And it's doing so from a position of uh, being veiled and greedy and you know acquisition and 
you know, cutting into the rights of others and taking the rights of others, which is the consciousness that the majority of humanity, and especially elites, operate from and leadership, that sort of thing. Um, so Dostoevsky here in this story is kind of retelling a very similar thing, um, where this grand inquisitor, where Jesus comes back in, in the middle of the inquisition, and he's walking about the people, and the church realizes, oh no, he's back. <laughs> so they arrest him, and then they interrogate Jesus himself, and then the, the, the rest of the chapter is the interrogation as a monologue of the grand inquisitor of the church, you know, just basically lambasting and haranguing Jesus Christ himself about why he decided to return. It's a great, it's a, it's a kind of a, a story within the story of the Brothers Karamanov. If you've not read this novel, the Brothers Karamanov, it is, it, this thing is one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written. Get your hands on it and read it. Sold. Yeah, it's old, but it's the one of the greatest pieces of literature ever. <laughs> No, no, I said sold. Sold, yeah. 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 Anyone else? We're going, we've gone way over an hour. Um, anywho, um, all right, continue reciting the dhikr of Yasubuhu, O oh, oh, glorified. Um, other people are reporting to me that they're 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 having like real experiences by reading the chapter and reciting the vicar, which is basically the whole purpose of this entire course, is that we're not just intellectualizing this, we're also having experiential things happen and through the prism of the vicar. Um, keep reading it, keep doing the vicar, and then we'll meet up again same time next week, next Saturday, and everybody be well. Yallah. <laughs>